Welcome to the Spokane Users Group and our new space. For those of you who haven't been here, we've just recently moved into uh, this new building. Tonight, you get to hear from the one, the only, Mr. Michael Stokesbury, uh, who goes by Stokes somehow. I wish he went by Barry, but he goes by Stokes. <laughs> he is a, this isn't, these aren't the right slides. I was going to say, yeah. He is a very senior software developer, yeah. getting more senior every day. Uh, and he was actually one of the co-founders. I didn't know that. That was yeah. the co-founders of the Spokane yeah. Users Group. Man, that's really cool. Uh, he's done a lot of stuff around .NET Core. Actually, we did the first project in .NET Core. Well, .NET Core, it went into beta 8, and then it went into alpha 1 after that. They actually decided to roll the whole thing back, and they said, oh, we're, we're going to go live in like a month. It's like, no, we're going to go live in six months. And we were working on a project that was actually supposed to go live in like two months. And I think we actually had to go live on the beta software Anyway, it was really interesting. Microsoft kind of pulled the rug out from underneath us. So be careful with some of the betas. Don't, it just until it goes live, it's not real. Uh, but it was, it was really interesting in here, it, being in and working together on the very early days of the, the, the early beta releases. And we actually started on a pre-release version a year before that, where we did a, a talk on that. So it was, there's just been a lot of great stuff. And, and, and Stokes has really been in on the ground floor and understands a lot of the details about how a lot of these things are done, especially around some of the ASP.NET stuff. So um, I think you do a great job. Um, he's a code monkey. He's still looking for a manager named Rob. So if you know one, he'll be looking to, to change jobs. If you're, and if, you, if you're not familiar with that, you need to search on YouTube for Code Monkey and watch some videos because Jonathan Colton has a wonderful piece of music out there that lots of people have done videos to um, that is absolutely fantastic. So how many people know code, the Code Monkey song? Anybody? Oh, there's a few. Okay, yeah, that's, that's some good stuff. So anyway, he'll offend you somehow, I'm sure. I think Phil put that part in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I thought it was very apropos. I didn't yeah. pick it out. Well, so. Like, so far, it hasn't been removed, yeah. So. Anyway. Give a good big hand hey, to thank you, sir. Yeah. And we did learn how to operate a Mac there, Grant. That was nice. Yeah. I was impressed. You use Google Forms really well. Yeah. yeah. So the topic tonight, it's funny, right? So... Uh, kind of as I told Grant, we're flying by the seat of our pants here. So the topic tonight I think that everyone showed up for was, uh, what was it? Kind of AS, what's new in ASP.NET Core 3 and what's new in .NET Core 3. Well, um, we, are going to, we are going to cover some of those bases, but I will be honest with you, when you sit there and say what's new in ASP.NET Core 3, you end up going to a document that looks like this. And you'll notice that scroll bar there on the right, and that's everything that's new in ASP.NET Core 3. We're not going to go through all that. I guarantee you we're not going to hit all that. Uh, I'm going to actually, I kind of decided to switch my talk just a tad based off of some conversation that Grant and I had. It's still going to be ASP.NET Core 3 and .NET Core 3, but it's more of a, instead of, I'm, I'm famous for starting off at a brand new project and hit the ground from a, here's an ASP.NET Core 3.0 project, because everyone starts brand new, right? No one has legacy apps that they have to upgrade or anything like that. Everyone hits the ground running with the latest and greatest technology. And I know when Grant and I were talking the other day, he's like, you know what would be fun to do at that launch event is more of a, how do you get from 2.2 to 3.0? What, what are some of the pain points that you run into? So I'm going to be kind of covering what's new in ASP.NET 3.0 around how do I get from a 2.2 project, or sorry, a 2.1 project up to 3.0 instead. So we are going to be covering new stuff, but this isn't going to be a typical, my typical talk of what's new. So what I'm basically going to be covering is, so here I've got a project that is just a simple, Yes, it's not a blog. So for everyone who's come and watched my talks before, I usually talk about a blog because that's my, I've rewritten a blog engine like eight times and I've never written a blog post. Um, but when I'm learning a new technology, I sit there and I say, hey, let's write a blog. Everyone's familiar with what a blog is. Um, I scrapped that. We've been kind of doing a Secret Santa concept. And I'm like, well, I know you can't really talk about Secret Santa because we haven't had Thanksgiving yet, but I'm jumping over Thanksgiving like all the other major outlets out there. Um, and it's not a full-blown Secret Santa. You'll notice my models is actually pretty thin in regards to the fact that you can basically say what gift you want. That's all I've got in this Secret Santa, right? But kind of where I've got it is this is a .NET Standard 2.0 project that's targeting all 2.1 stuff. My ASP.NET Core app is really, for the most part, a very out-of-the-box 
I've got a home controller, I've got a gifts controller. It's very much a scaffolded, but it's going to be kind of walking through, okay, if you came from an MVC world and you wanted to go from 2.0 to 3.0, what does that take? Um, we are going to, so I'm gonna walk through that. We're going to walk through what it takes um, to kind of do a SignalR upgrade because I do like SignalR. So we're gonna show some of the features that are either changed or new in 3.0. And then of course you can't do an ASP.NET talk on 3.0 without talking about Blazor. So we are actually going to attempt, and I say attempt because I've succeeded once and failed five times, on adding Blazor into an existing MVC app. So by the time we're done, we should have actually even Blazor components working inside of this MVC app, not a brand new Blazor project, here's how you do a spa from scratch. It's, I wanna create a Blazor component, add it to my, add it to one of my views and actually be able to use that functionality. So that's kind of where we're going. So I apologize for the clickbait on, hey, what's new in ASP.NET 3.0? Come to learn everything that's new in ASP.NET 3.0, .NET Core 3.0. Um, it's gonna basically be that. If you are okay with that, great, stick around. If not, enjoy the food. Um, feel free to step out whenever you want. I'm not gonna be offended. Uh, but that's the path that we're gonna take. I'm also, I will touch, there's the gotchas that came up with me on .NET Core 3.0 as well when I migrated. So I am gonna point out some of those gotchas that I've hit as well. So I'm going to fail often in this talk. Sometimes it's on purpose, sometimes it's on accident, but because I've already warned you ahead of time, you won't know which one I actually meant to and not, didn't mean to do. So I can actually fail from here on out and I'm safe, right? Uh, so first things first, let's just make sure that we've got an application up and running. So let me fire up, how many people are actually doing MV, ASP.NET Core MVC stuff today? Okay, a couple people. So when I fire up this startup, you'll, for people who have seen it, there's nothing fancy in my startup. I mean, this is kind of a boilerplate startup. I do have identity in here. So I have actually added identity. Um, we've added the default UI, so I've not done any UI stuff in my identity piece, but I do have some of that. These are all basically just whatever you get out of the box. And we're going to walk through this and then say, and let me run it. Let me just do this so you guys know that it's a running application. And then we're gonna break it by sitting there and saying we're gonna to go to .NET Core 3.0 because as much as people wanna say it's seamless up, it's not necessarily a seamless upgrade. Um, there's minor changes. I will admit, I didn't have to change a lot on this, but there are changes you have to make. Um, did, it's still trying to build. I am backed by a SQLite database, so we actually will have data in our database um, that is gonna take a little while to gen up because I have had to blow it away. Yeah, good, Secret Santa SQLite did come up, so we're good there. So I've got my Secret Santa app and wow, um, Zoom, right? Control Shift Plus, there we go. Um, so I have a secured controller, so I've got GIFs, let me go in, I'm just gonna register as a new user. Actually, yeah, we'll do this just so you guys can see it works. Um, And I can come in here and I can create a new gift, right? So the only thing right now that I've got on my model, so let me jump to here really quick. You'll notice my model for a gift, I have string, string, int, string, right? So when I come over here, the reason why I say that is if I come here and I click my create button right now, the only thing that pops up as a required field is my integer because it's not a nullable int, right? So we've, we're, we've got just the basic um, jQuery, unobtrusive stuff that's working there. Uh, but I can come in here and I can say, oh, let's go with a uh, Raspberry Pi 4, right? And that's always a fun one to get. And that's gonna be number one on my list. And we'll create, and so I get my list of gifts. And again, this is, I, you can tell I've spent a ton of time on this UI because this is as vanilla as you get on what you get out of the box when you say go and scaffold me something, right? Um, the idea here, at first when I was gonna do this talk, I'm like, oh, I wanna put a Vue.js, this, I get famous for going down rabbit holes. I'm gonna put a Vue.js thing on this and it's gonna have all this fun stuff. And I'm like, but that shows absolutely nothing that's new with .NET Core 3. So that's a waste of my time and your time. So we are just doing a standard out of the box MVC app as much as it may have killed me um, to do that. But we have an MVC app that's up and running. 
So let's do the first thing that we need to do, which is let's go to our domain. We're going to bump this to 2.1 because I want to get some C Sharp 8 features in here. So let me take a step back, right? Uh, how many people did come to the event that we did a couple weeks ago? Okay, we had a few people. Uh, so in order to get C Sharp 8.0 features, which are new in .NET Core 3.0, you do have to either be running net standard 2.1, well, the supported way. I've been told I'm wrong making this statement. The supported way of doing this is net standard 2.1 and net core 3.0 or higher. That's the Microsoft, when they tell you we're going to support C Sharp 8 features, that's what they tell you. You will sit there and talk to Mark, bless his soul, that sits there and says some of the stuff works. Well, I'm not gonna sit there and try to figure out what some of that stuff is. I go to net standard 2.1, .NET Core 3.0. The caveat here is once I make this net standard 2.1, I am not supported, I cannot run this on a full framework. So the, it's, it's very interesting. Um, Microsoft, when they came out with, it was either 2.0 or 2.1, ASP Net Core, they sat there and said, we're not gonna support the full framework anymore. They, they came out, adamantly made that statement of, if you wanna write ASP Net Core applications, it will only run on .NET Core, you can't run on the full framework and community went up in arms. They're like, you can't do this, .NET Core's not ready for it. Well, a couple years later, yeah, I know they're on a yearly release cycle, so maybe just a year later, they've now sat here and said, .NET Core, ASP Net Core 3 is only gonna run on .NET Core 3.0. So just an FYI, if you decide you wanna upgrade your application to ASP Net Core 3, you have to run on .NET Core 3. It does not run on the full framework anymore. There is no intention of it running on the full framework. Um, I saw a blog post probably about a month ago that sat there and said, we have migrated as many APIs from the full framework as we're gonna migrate. We've made changes to .NET Core 3.0 that have now diverged us from the full framework enough to where these two are not really compatible anymore. So if you wanna go .NET, ASP .NET Core 3, you are now running on .NET Core. On the bright side, what is it? We're 3.0 this year, I think we're 5.0 next year because you gotta skip 4.0. Um, they are dropping the .NET Core concept, right? Come, come .NET 5, that is going to be the .NET Core underpinnings, but that's where it's going from here on out. So they're just calling it, or they're just gonna call it .NET 5, uh, which is why they're skipping because we already have a 4 version. They're sitting there and saying full-blown .NET, which isn't the full framework that you get in .NET 4, but we're not having two frameworks anymore. We are calling .NET from five on out, core is dropped, it, we're cross-platform, and this is the one that we're putting all of our attention into. So just an FYI, if you are still running full framework, it's not that the writing's on the wall that it's gonna go away. I mean, it's still got long-term support. In fact, they've sat here with AS, because of the modification they made to ASP.NET Core 3.0, saying it's only gonna run on the .NET Core framework. ASP.NET 2.1, which is their long-term release, which is why I'm upgrading from a 2.1 project to a, I didn't pick 2.2, I did pick a .NET Core 2.1 project. Um, that is going to, because that is the last long-term release of ASP.NET Core that supports running on the full framework. I think that they've sat there and said they're gonna support ASP.NET Core 2.1 for more years than they usually do a standard long-term support, just an FYI. So you're not, if you decide I need to still have an application that runs on full framework and I wanna use ASP.NET Core, target 2.1, it's gonna be around for a long time. If you decide I can move on to .NET Core, they've ported enough libraries for me, I would say jump to Core 3.0, or in fact now, what's funny is you're gonna see me, I, I called it a .NET Core 3.0 talk, um, I am actually going to, because I am running the preview bits of Visual Studio, uh, I already have 3.1 preview installed on my machine. So 3.1 is the long-term support, what we got 3.0 launched a month ago, and 3.1 comes out this month. So um, at the, by, the, by the end of November, 3.1, which will be long-term support, should be out. Yes, sir. What is the Microsoft? I, I see saying November 34th. November 34th. I like that. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Good to know. I watched some of the Ignite videos and I did not see that announcement. But so we're, we're probably not targeting November, which is fair enough. Yeah. So uh, that 
if they are compiled, if so, I'm I'm going to if they have the target framework of 2.0, they will work because you are pulling in the net standard 2.0 version of that, which was compiled against core. So some people are writing multi-targeted libraries, right? It's a net standard 1.6 and a net 4.7.1 or something like that. If you're running on full framework, you're going to pull in the net 4.7.1 version. If you're running on .NET Core, you're going to pull in the net standard 1.6 version. So if, they, if they're 2.0 compliant and they've targeted 2.0, you will get a, you're not going to get a full framework build, version of their build. You're going to get the net standard 2.0 build. So what about like some of the third party libraries where they weren't officially 2.0, but you know, they allow you to use them and pretend that it was 2.0? Because right, because you can kind of do the, 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 you're kind of doing the, hey, fake out. If I get a net standard, treat it as if it's a, or if I get a net 4.7.1, Treat it as if it's a net standard 2x or something like that. That I'm not sure. I would assume, yeah, I don't even want to make that assumption. Um, in that situation, were you running on .NET Core as your underlying runtime, or are you running on the full framework as your underlying runtime? Because if you're still .NET Core as your runtime, you're pulling in that library, it's able to get sucked in, you're good, because you're not running on the full framework. You're, you're utilizing a library that might have been built on it, but you're not running on that framework, so I would imagine you'd still be good. Um, knock on wood, even though it's plastic, right? Uh, I think that that would be safe. I haven't tried that scenario, though. Uh, so yes, so net standard, sorry, 2.1, net core 3, uh, one of the first things you can actually do when you go net core 3.1 uh, is get rid of all these because they do not have the meta package anymore. So one of the things that .NET Core has done is, or ASP.NET Core has done is they got rid of, I know what, they renamed it in, from 2.0 to 2.1 or something like that, and now they just sat there and said, you know what, you don't need it. Um, what kind of indicates your meta package now is the fact that you have SDK.web, and you're targeting a 3.x netcore app. So that being said, they've also removed packages out of there, and you're going to notice that some of my stuff is going to break, which is okay. Uh, so let me see. Let's do a save all, which is not what that was. Control. There we go. We're going to do a save all. I'm now going to cheat. I'm going to come into my dependencies because you noticed I upgraded my underlying packages, but I did not upgrade my, or sorry, I upgraded my net standard stuff, but I did not upgrade my packages. I never want to remember this version number, so I always come in here and steal them from here. So we're going to upgrade now to the 3.1 version of our reference assemblies that we were using, which is okay. And we're going to come down here and do the exact same thing. Manage NuGet packages. I've got updates. You'll notice I have the include pre-release because I do want, okay. So, right, since I wiped out, I'm not going to pull the new serial log stuff in. Um, since I wiped out all the versions and all the Microsoft stuff that was in here because I didn't need it anymore, I don't have any packages that I need to upgrade inside of my web application. Um, that being said, some of my stuff is going to work because of, and I'm not going to call it magic, some of my stuff is just going to, so let's do this. Let's do a control shift B. We're going to see what fails, right? And we will, we will actually get, what's funny is you're going to get a compiler warning, and then when we run it, you're going to get a runtime error. Because, you know, warn me in the compiler and then blow up because of a compiler warning. So, yeah. Uh, that being said, though, one, one thing I do want to point out while this is building is how I made the comment on the meta package has been removed. Well, EF Core used to be part of that meta package. With .NET Core 3.0, they've removed EF Core out of that meta package. So I would have had to actually come into my UI and reference my EF Core stuff, except for the fact that I'm referencing my domain project that is already referencing EF Core. So I'm kind of getting these by default because of another project reference. If I wouldn't have had my reference to this project that was referencing these packages, I would have had to go back into my ASP.NET Core app and add these back in. So you don't get to delete all of the Microsoft entries 
because they've cleaned up stuff. You get to delete some of the Microsoft entries, but then you still have to come back and add some more because EF core is out. And I think my compiler warning, I did get one compiler warning, um, which I believe is telling me, yes. yes, add default UI. So this was working before, right? We, we were up and running before. This is another piece that got taken out of the meta package. We do not have a reference to the, and I'm just gonna get it right here, right, is, where's my error? Identity Builder does not contain no extension except a first argument type, but I think it tells me, it doesn't tell me. Um, so I'm gonna cheat here and come to my notes, because you know, it's always good to have notes. So identity UI, and yes, you won't be able to read that. Um, we will just do this. I do need to come in here and add a NuGet package in my web project now uh, for identity.ui because this is not part of the meta package anymore. So again, it's not a seamless integration where you just say upgrade my .NET Core version and run, right? You do have some cleanup to do. So let's do this to at least get our compiler errors gone. Installing NuGet package, fun. Okay, you'll see I've got some green squigglies, right? But me personally, if I sit here and I'm now done and I see, oh, I've got three warnings. I usually expect that means I can probably still run an application. Unfortunately, when I do this, because this type is obsolete, this type is obsolete, fine, no problem. I don't care about obsolete. I can always go back and clean those up later. I get a boom. Okay, what happened? I had three compiler warnings, and now I'm getting a, hey, it failed to start. This is actually kind of fun. They did add, they improved their logging, right? So I will admit Microsoft has done a good job in .NET Core 3.0 of improving their IIS logging. So when you run your application, if you come down here and look at the core web server, in your you're going to sit here and see that, if I can scroll up in there, endpoint routing does not support application builder use MVC. To use iApplication use MVC, set the MVC options, endpoint, enable endpoint routing equal to false. So Microsoft in the, and I think it's a good decision that they made, but Microsoft's out there and said, hey, you know what? Yes, we've changed up our routing a couple times, which is why we still have this which is why we have this compatibility version. And now they've sat there and said, hey, we're changing up our routing again. So inside of here, if we wanted to keep this as is, right, we don't want to change to their new routing. We want to keep this as is. We can come in here and just do the options and say options dot, uh, what was it, enable endpoint routing equals false. We're fat, dumb, and happy. Control Shift B, we compiled, we run, and our application again is very small font, but we are up and running. Um, I can come in here, I can go to my GIFs, I can log in, I didn't have to wipe out my database yet, so I can log in here, as long as I remember my credentials, and I'm good to go, I've still got my data. So that in a nutshell is, okay, I have taken a 2.2 application upgraded to 3. I know. Yes, there were a couple of pieces in there where you're like, okay, well, I've got a way more complicated MVC application than what you have. Um, but really a vanilla, or I shouldn't say a vanilla, it, for the most part, an MVC application where you've got your configuration set up the way that we've got this one set up, which again, I would say a lot of my settings, I mean, I usually have a little bit more middleware in here and stuff like that, but really for the most part, a lot of my settings are about that when I'm just trying to do an MVC app. Um, like I said, I didn't need to go into a JavaScript or MVC or sorry, Vue.js or anything like that. That has nothing to do with the bearing here. Uh, but if we decided that we wanted to take this one step further and say, you know what, I want some of the new features that Microsoft has. So let's use their endpoint routing, which is comment out this guy and say services dot add controllers and views, controllers with views. So Add controllers is going to allow you to do an API. That's going to just give you the API, the web API stuff. Add controllers with views is going to allow me to do MVC. I can now have controllers with views and 
I'm good there. So I'm not adding MVC anymore. I'm adding controllers with views. If I want to add other things, as we'll go into later, like signal R and stuff like that, I've got to explicitly add those. I'm not getting that out of the box. This now allows me to come down here, though, and say, which is nice. I now come down here and I say, use endpoints. And my endpoints are going to be, uh, it is going to be use, no, uh, come on. If I, oh, there we go. Map default controller route. Very similar to what I had there. Okay, all looks good here, right? I mean, I've got, I've replaced my add MVC with add controllers and views because you know we had to rename that, why not? Um, and mark this as obsolete, so I guess that's why they renamed it was they didn't want to change the underlying stuff because as you saw, obviously, if we didn't want endpoint routing, we couldn't have overwritten this or else other things would have broke. Um, so we obsolete add MVC, we're out of that part now. We obsoleted use MVC with default routing. Okay, fine, I'm gonna use my endpoints. We're, we're good. Let's run this application now. And I blow up. It's okay. Why did I blow up? I blew up, and this, this one actually cracks me up. Uh, endpoint middleware matches endpoint set up by, I think this is what I was expecting. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, that's not quite what I was expecting. Okay. I ran into this error before, and I do have to admit, the error message is, so here's the error message. I know I kind of looked at it really quick. Basically what it's saying is, hey, you sat here and said, and I don't know why you had to do this. Um, basically what it's saying is, hey, you're trying to implement, you're trying to actually use the endpoint middleware, so endpoint routing, but you didn't tell us that you wanted to use routing. You just told us you wanted to use endpoints. Okay, great. So I actually do need to come up here and say app.use routing. And yes, there is a reason why I put it up here. Um, there is a, there, there's rhyme and reason to this whole thing. So what they've done with their endpoint routing or actually with their rewrite of their routing, their rewrite of the routing, yeah. Um, is they've actually set this up to where you can use a lot of your middleware now within your routing. You can use authentication and stuff like that, P pieces that weren't available to you before, you can now actually use inside of your own middleware. So before it was kind of, okay, I've got my endpoints, they could always use my authentication, but if I had something else that needed to be somewhere in the middle after routing, but before I got to my mapping of my controllers, you were stuck because your middleware was always, I, I could sit here and I could say, hey, use my endpoints that have this, and that was after use authentication, but I wasn't able to basically intercept anything between use authentication inside of routing and whatever endpoints that I had actually defined. Here, I could write my own custom middleware that allows me to get access to routing and to my authentication that's all been set up for me as well. Um, I have not run into a scenario where I've needed that, but that was one of the big reasons for allowing you to do this, was they sat there and said, we didn't give you enough hooks to be able to use the tools that we had. Um, Signal R was a big one, right? Was you use, we used to have app dot you, and we'll, we'll see it, but you had app dot use MVC with default route, app dot use signal R, app dot use, they were all kind of treated as separate sections in the middleware. Now it's, we use endpoints, and we'll, you'll see when we do the signal R, we just create another signal R endpoint. We're not necessarily having to put a whole separate chunk of middle in there. So, um, so yes, yeah, so we're basically saying, hey, use your routing system and then use authentication. This is still gonna blow up, by the way. Right, so you, What your, what your routing or what your permissions would be if you could get to that endpoint? Yes, exactly, yeah. So let's run this, if I hit Control F5 correctly. Okay, it comes up, right? We're good, We're not, we don't have our runtime error. So I come here to GIFs, oh, <laughs> exactly. Okay, no compile error that told me about this, right? 
No, nothing there. These, these are fun things that you run into. But it sat there and said, you know what? You, you made a call saying that you wanted to use authentication, which is fine. We had the use authentication before as well. But now it sat there and said they've pulled some of their functionality out of use authentication. because Let's get as granular as possible about what you actually want. And so you'll notice this error message sits here and says, OK, well, you're, you're also trying to use authorization. And where am I trying to use authorization? I'm trying to use authorization on this controller with this attribute. That's all I'm doing, right? I didn't change that part of the code. I've been using that the whole time. Well, no, our middleware decided that we needed to break out authentication and authorization because these are two separate things. So if you want to use authorization as well, you need to now sit here and say, oh, by the way, use authorization as well. Um, I was just about to say, do not get that in the wrong order. Okay. Um, <laughs> Because what will happen is, and where have I done this? I, I did put this in the wrong order. And at one point in time, I was able to get in anonymously because I sat there and said, hey, I'm going to use authorization. So it sat there and said, authorize. Great. You, have, you are authorized with an empty identity, right? And it's like, fantastic. That's not what I want. Um, so yes, if you put use authorization before use authentication, it will automatically sit there and create a empty identity for you and you will authorize. In fact, if I do this, I, yeah, um, that would have been nice. So if I do this now, if I were to try to attach a role, now I'm never able to get in there because it's going to sit there and say, no, you have no identity. I don't know who you are, right? So, and I think that this is the order that I did it in. So let's double check. I'm, I'm all for having some fun here. Let's put a breakpoint here. Because I think the fun part is, and this is where it gets confusing, if I remember correctly, it actually will ask me to log in. But my, because my authorization was done before my authentication, my cookie is never updated. So if I come to GIFs, oh, oh, right, yes. I remember this one too. Okay, now we're authorizing, right? We're good. We, we have now sat there and said, hey, I need you to go out and authorize. Well, what's happened here? is, uh, and how many people have actually used, a, whether it's in production, which I, I have no issues using this in production either, but how many people have actually used the default UI stuff before when you're trying to do authentication? Or how many people have added it and then scaffolded it and changed it up and removed the add default UI, but you're still using what was scaffolded for you? Nobody. Okay. The magic here is add default UI is not MVC anymore. It's now Razor Pages. So all I said was, I want to add controllers with views. I need to also add razor pages so that I can use the default UI. Again, these are steps we didn't have to use when we were in 2.1. These are all steps that we get to do inside of here. And I also have to come down here and map an endpoint. Endpoints dot map, and I think it's just map razor pages. There we go. So, hey, see, this is, this is fun. This is, all, this is all good times. This is migrating from a 2.1 to a 3.0 application. You guys thought you were going to learn what's new. You're not learning what's new. You're just learning how to break your own code. Yeah. Upgrade. You'll break it. Okay, so we've got this. Now I should be able to come to GIFs. Sweet. I'm now getting to my razor page. And now if I do a mic at stokesbury.me, super secret password. Oh, that's right. I get stuck in a loop because my cookie's not getting updated. So that's what happens. It doesn't let you in. It just doesn't let you in because um, you're now stuck in a loop because I think that is better than the other way. I did run into, I know I got in once. Did I have, did I use, did I do this? I wonder if I did this at one point in time. So then I come to GIFs. No, it still wants me to do this. So maybe they fixed it. Because uh, I was in, I was not in the actual release build of 3.0 when I ran into my issue. Yeah, so okay, it's not going to let you in. I got in one time where, yes, it, it asked me to authorize. Or how did I do that? Now I'm, now I'm baffled. But yes, order matters. Long story short, order matters. Um, make sure that you put 
authenticate before you put authorize. They have a, so no, there is no app dot use everything I need for authentication type of thing, unfortunately. It's, it's not like, exactly, well, I mean, this is what's nice about this, right, is map default controller route. I didn't have to sit there and say, oh, map route and set my, index, my, my default controller to home, my default index to, or my, yeah, my default action, sorry, to index, stuff like that, which you used to have to do. They now just kind of have a, hey, give me what is most common. I would not have expected this to be a common enough scenario to where they sat there and said, yeah. you know what, we should really break this out because you might want to use authentication and not authorization, or worse, you might want to use authorization, but then never want to authenticate, which you can't, right? Um, it, it does seem interesting that they do that. I will say... Uh, <coughs> with, uh, if you say identity, yes. yes. If, it, Exactly, exactly. And one thing that is nice is I will admit their docs have gotten really good, and so they do actually have, um, and I can do, uh, so what we have a, there is an actual upgrade. This is what's new, but they do have a, and I thought I had it at one point in time. Is it a tutorial? No. Um, well, let's just do this. They have, an up, they have actually a really good upgrade guide. Upgrade from 2.2 to 3.0. Let's see how, there we go. So they do have this migrate from ASP.NET Core 2.2 to 3.0, which does sit there and say, yeah, you update the project file, you get to blow out the package references, um, and you will notice on, is it startup changes? So they do come down here on startup changes and talk about some of the stuff we've been doing. There's your use authorization. Yeah, app was added to the templates in order to show the authorization middleware. Where did they have the what? Well, that's what I was wondering. Well, so now routing startup is more around the um, kind of their new stuff that they're doing with endpoint routing. But there was, oh, yeah, so here's, so if the app uses authentication authorization feature, so it is kind of in the my. Ironically enough, it's in the routing startup code underneath migrate startup configure. Um, if it uses authentication authorization features such as the authorized page or the authorized attribute, place the call to use authentication and use authorization after use routing and use cores, but before use endpoints. So they do give you a, which is, you'll notice I did specifically say I'm putting my use routing here for a reason. Um, I read the guide and you do want to, and I think, oh, you know what? I think that was my issue. I think I had used routing after my authentication. Yeah, things just got weird where I could get into a spot where I was not authenticated, but I could still go in. Um, and maybe that was my used routing and stuff like that. So order even matters, not even so much around use authentication, use authorization. The used routing needs to go above those as well. So pay attention to these migration guides as you're making these changes because it will cause you a headache. But no, there is no, yeah, use everything I care about type of stuff, unfortunately. That wraps the two. Right, right. Or just, if you're writing a lot of projects that you know you got to do that, you've got it, it's route memorization now, come on. Actually, on the bright side, if you're doing a new project, you, like I said, with the new template, you would actually get it out of the box if you picked their identity as well. So, um, but yes, no, you could write your own that just added both. Yeah. Question so far. Okay, so far so good. Control Shift B. We're back up and running, I believe. Oh yeah. So let's make a couple of changes. Let's clean up the rest of our green because I'm not a fan of the green stuff, right? So. They do sit there and say, okay, iHosting environment is disappearing, which is fine. What do I want to put it to? Oh, I need to make it to iWebHosting environment. Because, so where Microsoft kind of went with this was they are allowing you, they're trying to make it easier to host ASP.NET Core applications, not necessarily in the web. So you have a iHosting, you do have a 
hosting environment that might not be hosted via IIS or Kestrel. It might be hosted in a, um, well, still hosted through Kestrel, but might be started up through a uh, Windows service or something like that, right? So you aren't necessarily going to be an I hosting environment. You're not an I web host at that point in time. You're a I some other type of host at that time. So they are trying to be very explicit about how you want to do this. So I web hosting environment. I could have sworn is what that told me I needed to do. I web host. Sorry. Yes. I web host environment because I'm expecting this one to light up green, but now what's fun is this doesn't light up green anymore. So your is development is now in a different namespace, so you do have to now pick extensions hosting in order to get that to work again. But no problem there. Um, the other piece that you might want to go in and change, because this is another piece that has changed. Excuse me, sorry. Uh, sorry. So my main is a little bit bigger than most people's main. I have actually modified the snot out of this because I like to do my logging. I set up serial log and everything else, so even with application crashes, I get something that pops out into serial log. So that's kind of all, that's really all this is doing. I also go in and do my database migration on startup and stuff like that. So it's got a little bit more than what you usually get out of the box. Um, the big one here is if I decide I want to, and I know I had this, what did I change? Oh yeah, so ironically enough now, this is AI host builder. which now takes a, if we do this, I do a dot, yeah, you know what, I know I've got my code here, sorry, I'm cheating. There we go. I'm gonna cheat, because I'm not even gonna try to, let's, let's pretend like we know what we're doing here. We're all good engineers, I went out to, I couldn't figure out how to do it, right? So what do you do? You go to Stack Overflow, you copy paste code from somewhere else. Really, I actually took this from Microsoft's other template. But you'll notice here, you actually now have a iHost builder, not an iHost, not an iWeb host builder anymore. But you, inside of the host builder, I'm specifically telling I'm creating a web host. So you also have a, if I remember correctly, we have a dot, you can do a, just a configure host configuration, configure app configuration, so on and so forth. We are still trying to create a website, so we are using the configure web host defaults. I'm not configuring a different type of application. So they are trying to get into the, how can I start to do this a little bit more generic? Um, I do need to now update my method here, but that's it. And since I did copy paste, I probably should have shown you what the difference was, but we can do this. Yeah. The joys of Git, right? Oh, actually, let me do this really quick. Sorry. Yes, I do. I use Git for more stuff than I, we're going to call this netcore3 migration. Yes, we want to save changes. OK. So this is just an easy way for me to do this really quick, because I know I did a quick copy paste there. But if we go to program, you'll notice here really not a whole lot changed, but the signature has a little bit, right? We are now creating it off of a host instead of a web host, and we're configuring a web host default and now kind of using web builder options instead of it being directly off of the create default builder. So same. Same idea, same stru uh, same ideas, different structure, right? Okay, success. That should now, let me close this down. If all went well, I should have no more warnings. I'm up to date. If I look at my error list, zero warnings, zero errors. We're golden. Let's make sure we still run, and then we're going to break it again because that's what we're here for. I can log into GIFs because I think I put my order back correctly. Okay, and I still get my GIFs. So everything's still working. I can edit this. Um, just really cool, and I'm a geek, right? I just can't spell. So everything is still working. We've got our application up and running. We're golden. We are now truly a .NET Core 3.0 app. 
Yay, congratulations. You have now upgraded. Now the fun part is, and this was actually something that has bit me, so I'm going to point it out, is how many people have actually heard that one of the C sharp features of one of the C sharp 80 features is this? Oh, nullable. Everything is, or nothing is nullable now, right? You, yes, exactly. You, you you sit there and you enable nullable, so nothing is nullable type of thing. Yeah, um, which is fun. I mean, that's totally obvious. That when I come in here, it's supposed to fix the billion dollar mistake, yes. Where we should never get an object reference not set to an instance of an object ever again if you make this change, right? That's, that's the, the promise. Well, that's the hope, yeah. So if I come in here and I say enable nullable, and I'm going to enable nullable on my other, pro, on my other guy here, and we do a control shift B. I'm now going to get warnings all over the place again. But you're going to notice I now have... The fun part is, is even so here, right, on my gift, and I don't know if you remember before, but I've got a string and a string and a string, but because now I've sat here and said, hey, by the way, I want you to do potential null checks for me on things that are usually nullable, but um, I want you to basically treat, treat my objects as if they're not nullable now. And so now I'm going to get a ton of warnings that sit here and say, hey, you've got a non-nullable property name that is uninitialized. And it's like, well, when did string become non-nullable? Well, this is, this is a C sharp, -O, C -sharp 8.0 feature that is supposed to warn us of no more, hey, name dot starts with, and you get a, uh, sorry, name was never assigned, but that's a runtime error. Now they're trying to catch it more compile time. So they are trying to give you these warnings. The fun part, though, is, and this one, this one killed me, and we will, let me actually, let's do this. Let me open up this. I ran my migration a while ago before I made this change, right? And you're going to notice that, yeah, and so after we get through all of their stuff that they created for us, when I come down here to GIFs, you're going to notice here that I have a name that is nullable in my database. I have a description that is nullable in my database, and I have a URL that is nullable in my database. I've now just turned on the don't allow nulls in C-sharp feature. If I come over here, And I go to repos. Uh, I think I'm in my Bram man. Yes, good. Secret Santa. And I then go into source and Secret Santa web UI. And this is going to break. Um, .NET EF. It's not going to break, actually. This, this is totally legit. I'm fine doing this. Um, add enabled nullable. Oh, that's not good. This is going to break. Sorry, I forgot one parameter on here. It's not going to like me on this. But it takes a little while for it to figure out that it doesn't like me. Oh, right. Breaks for a couple reasons. I do know I need to, because my project, my domain project is in a different spot, I am going, no, let's not break again. Um, let me at least get that set up right. So this is now complaining, and yeah, that font is fun to try to read, isn't it? Um, this is basically complaining because my web UI, again, we've pulled out Entity Framework core stuff from our um, giant manifest stuff, right? So it's now telling me, oh yeah, you're trying to do you're trying to do migrations, but you don't have your Entity Framework core designer in the project you're trying to run your migrations against. So I need to come into this guy. And you're going to notice I've actually typed this one quite a few times because when I come to browse, it's going to be one of the first things that actually pops up in my recent browsed. I need to install Entity Framework Core Design. Cool, no problem. I'm good with that. Still get my same warnings. Let's compile this, though. And now I run... Basically, all I'm doing, I'm assuming people have done EF core migrations before or EF migrations. Okay. So I'm just trying to scaffold out a new migration. Honestly, when I, I would have expected this to be empty because I did not change any of my objects, right? All I did was I went in and I changed a property inside of my CS proj file. So when I ran this, I was actually surprised when I ran it the first time, that I actually got something. This is going to complain because I only have the .NET Core, or sorry, the, 
the EF tools for 3.0 installed and it's saying, hey, you're using 3.1, that does not change the migration I'm going to get. Um, we can even upgrade that and I'll show you, but that will not, that had no impact on that. That's not what's caused this problem. But what's interesting now is if I come in here and I said, hey, I enabled nullable, you're going to notice now my database is sitting here and saying, oh, we're going to alter all of the columns that were string and make it so nullable is now false. So not only if my business objects now are nullable strings or non-nullable strings because I turned on the nullable flag. Um, turn on the nullable flag to make things non-nullable, right? Yes. Now my database, though, comes in and says, oh, you now have strings that are doing null checks. We're going to make it so your database requires them as well. So now we're, they're not nullable in the database as well. My database is going to blow up because alter column doesn't work with SQLite. So this is where I sit there and say I am going to blow away my database. But I do want to point that out because I was not expecting this when I first turned on nullable checks. I was not expecting the C-sharp nullable checks to all of a sudden impact my entity framework migrations that now said everything that you said was nullable is not nullable anymore because you're trying to do the C-sharp checks on it. Correct. Well, but that's the thing is technically it can, right? So C sharp isn't doing a runtime check. C sharp is only doing a compile time check. So even though I marked, these are more just warnings. This is not, by turning this on, I can still actually now, yes, I will get, C sharp will cause errors, will throw errors, it won't like me. But I can still come in here and, um, because you can turn off the null check when you do stuff. You can still put a null value in here. So it technically is not, they aren't changing the data type of string to say, hey, throw an error if you try to put null in there. It's just sitting there and saying, hey, you haven't assigned this a value yet. You might want to do that. It's more of a Roslyn analyzer than it is an actual runtime enforced thing. So I can still put null in there. Yeah? Uh, can you go back to the migration? Mm -hmm. Um, do I, I don't have a navigation property. My assumption is well, well, right. And at that point in time, you're kind of, it's, it's going to usually be around the ID, right? So a lot of those are going to be, is your int, technically it would still be, well, it depends on your constraint. If I'm going to have a one, to, like if I'm going to have a, technically if I would have set this up right, my user would have had a list of, list of GIFs so that I could only see my GIFs and you could only see your GIFs and stuff like that. I didn't do that. But technically that would also then just be a int on GIFs that would point back to this. So I wouldn't, it, that would still be non-nullable because it's an int and it's kind of a foreign key, it's a required foreign key for the most part. Um, you won't actually ever put a list of something inside the database. It's always going to be more off of a foreign key idea. And so, yes, it basically boils down to are you going to allow an entity in your database to not have a child for the most part, right? Um, and if you did that, then you'd actually have to even, I think, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong because now I'm just flying off the seat of my pants, which is why I say this goes wherever we want it to go. Um, I think at that point in time, even inside your data model, you would have actually had to mark that as a int question mark if you wanted to have a opportunity to have a nullable foreign key. So that is, and that's a good point, right? If I want to get this back to the way that I had it, well, we'll do this. Let me, let's blow away our database. Because this is the other part that's fun um, that I did not catch on to when I was first doing this. So I'm going to blow away my database, exit that so I can actually get access to my SQLite database. Kill my database, come on, die. Right click, delete. Okay, I'm going to delete my migrations because alter, like I said, alter doesn't work on SQLite, so I'm basically just going to regen my migrations. Control Shift B. Come back here, we're going to just change this guy to, uh, oh, you know what, we're just going to leave it for sanity's sake. We're just going to leave enabled nullable. Who cares what the name of migration is? And 
And let's run the code again. And yes, it is going to break at runtime. I'm going to warn you about that right now. Because when I come in here to GIFs, um, and the reason why this is going to happen, which I didn't necessarily call out, so it won't be intuitive, is I always create my own user that also has a first name and last name, but I didn't. So you can see I have my list here. I just never, I didn't make the form. There's no key association to GIFT or anything like that. So nothing that's really matching them up. I should have actually deleted that because that's useless right now. Um, so because I enabled nullable, because I ran that migration, the issue here is I never modified my UI. So when I want to come in here and register as a new GIST, I don't necessarily have the opportunity to put in my first name and last name. So when I say register, I get a, hey, sorry, first name can't be null. So this is, it wasn't so much that I actually saw that I got a migration. I'm like, okay, great, I got a migration. Then when I started getting into this of, oh, crap, some of my data now isn't actually, I, I never had entry points in my data that is now what used to be null and worked fine doesn't work anymore, right? So, okay, back to the drawing board. Let's uh, kill this guy so we can delete our database. And so we can delete our migrations because, again, alter column does not work with... I should just be doing these demos with SQL Server instead of SQLite, but it's really easy to get an empty database this way. But now if I come back here and I want to allow these to be null, I'm now using that same syntax that we used to use on nullable ints and everything else. So now I come in, I specifically tell my code, do nullable checks for me, but I want some of these to actually be null again. I want first name and last name to be null because I don't have a UI that lets, allows me to populate that. And we'll come back here on gift and actually say, you know what? I might not always have a URL. Uh, we'll always put in a description. So now let's run our migration again. Sorry about that. And if we come and actually check our migration file now, and on our, there's my, no, identity claim, identity user login, blah, blah, blah. So on my GIF now, Oh, I'm in the wrong one. Just kidding. That's my snapshot. I'm like, wait, that's not right. Yeah. So, yeah, this looks better. Yes. So now you'll notice in my users, and I know I didn't point this out last time, but we can see it here. In my users, my first name and last name are nullable is now set to true because I added the question mark. When we come down to the table that we were actually looking at before, um, you'll notice here that by adding the question mark, so I didn't have the question mark on name, so he's still false on nullable. I didn't have it on description, but I did put it on URL, so now that is nullable. So there is a way around it. Oh, and I do have user ID there, which is nullable true. Okay, good. Um, so it did actually create that relationship for me. I just didn't know I was doing that. Yeah. Uh, come to find out, I can always make stuff up as I go. Yeah. What's interesting is that, see, I would not have wanted that behavior, though. That's okay. Um, neither here nor there. I would have wanted a gift tied to a user, but this is telling me I don't have to have that. That's fine. I didn't mark it with required, so I'm okay with that. Which, actually, that was kind of one of the other things that I thought was funny, was a lot of times, if you wanted something that was nullable, oh, I know what that is. Just kidding. Um, ignore, ignore where I was going with the whole thing. So, you can get back your nullables by explicit, but this is a thing. This, is, this was not something that I was expecting. I was not thinking I was going to have to enable nullable flags, and then it would actually modify my database for me. Long story short. So we have that working. Let's log in. And then we'll get on to something actually exciting. Any questions while this is trying to run? No? So let's make sure we can still get in. Mike, it's Stokesbury on me. Yes, that is a valid email. I am that big of a geek. I have my own domain there. Uh, one thing I did want to point out here, though, is so one thing that's nice, we were talking about the um, unobtrusive JavaScript stuff that we have. Because I'm lazy and I didn't do any view models or anything like that, I am binding 
And again, for people that aren't familiar with MVC um, or haven't messed around with it too much, you'll notice here on my create, I'm actually I'm binding to my gift model. And we can expand out form, which has my first name or my, my name, my description, my priority, and URL. So we're binding actually to the gift. And so one thing that's kind of cool is by turning on that nullable stuff, if I now try to do create here, remember before we failed by saying, hey, priority is not filled out and it's required. But now it's automatically because these fields are now null, are, are now considered to be not null or not nullable, my UI validation is sitting there and saying, hey, these are now required fields. So again, this rippled across. I didn't change anything here in my code to add the checks here saying, hey, this is required. All I did was enable the nullable flag in my C-sharp 8, which is now saying these can't be null. So they're treating, the UI treats it as can't be null. The database treats it as can't be null. And so I can't submit data into my form. Uh, so this is string, but I made it question mark. Yeah, so I, I explicitly sat there and said, hey, I want this guy to be null. So yeah, so on gift, I allowed that to be, I did allow that to be a nullable string. You do get the same validation with an API controller. Yes. Yep. So it lights up a lot. I was not expecting the nullable check in C Sharp to light up as much as it actually did. Yes. And that is a, again, C Sharp 8 is only available in NetCore 3.0. So this is relevant to what's new in NetCore 3.0. Um, and yeah, you kind of get a lot of extra pieces there, which is good and bad. I, like I said, I, I like the UI sitting there saying, hey, you can't pass a null value in. I'm not going to let that happen. Still don't know if I like the database saying, hey, you, it's non-nullable because I wasn't expecting. That seemed like a bigger change. If, if all of a sudden I had fields that were null, cause, so I will admit, because I'm using SQLite, I can't run the alter column. I'm not sure what would happen if I went into a production database that used to allow description to be null, so it is now null, and then I run a migration that says this column can't be null anymore, I want to say, unfortunately, that I think that would break. I don't know if the migration would be able to run. Right. But. I was going to say I'd have to run an update statement before I could run my migration to say, yeah, make, mark this as not nullable. So, kind of a large impact just by turning on C-sharp eight nullable features. Um, so just an FYI, calling, calling that one out. You guys have been warned. Okay, let me, the what? Do nullable, you can change a null. Okay. Okay, so that is, I'm committing this just because I'm going to now switch over to another branch and basically lose everything that I've already done. Um, but we're, we're going to come back to this. So that was basically doing the .NET Core 3.0 ramifications of Nullable and upgrading an existing 2.1 project into a 3.0 project. Any questions there? Any questions so far? I'm actually surprised. I'm, I thought for sure I'd be done by 7, and I'm not even halfway through. So we'll, this will be fun. Um, I, you can enable it. Okay, so, and these are the some features that are C sharp 8 that work. Yeah. <laughs> and, gotcha. Okay. I was going to say, yeah, good, good to know. Okay. So you can get the non nullable C sharp 8 feature on full framework. Um, okay, so in interest of time, I'm going to ask you guys this. Do you want, do you care on, or do you want me to just kind of walk through really quick what it would take? SignalR, how many people are using SignalR? A couple people. Do you want to see how a migration from 2.0 to 3.0 goes with regards to SignalR, or do you want me to just kind of, what are you more interested in, SignalR or trying to get Blazor component working inside of Blazor? Okay. Um, I will call out though, so I, I, I won't walk through it. We won't make a whole demo on it. But 
there is a difference, right, how I made the comment of, and I'm not, I'm not going to get it working because I don't have, my JavaScript skills are good, but not that good to write a whole uh, signal R application off the top of my head. Um, but I do want to point out, inside a startup, you would do a endpoints dot map signal R uh, map, where is, uh, it is a map signal R endpoint. Oh, but I wonder if I'm missing, I bet you I'm missing, yeah. Oh, map signal R hub, I believe is what that's going to be. Introduce local, no. Um, so you'll map a signal R hub and you will have to services dot add signal R. See, I got that one. So we're good there. Uh, probably. And I know it then takes a string, which is chat hub, right? Oh, that's my issue too. It's a, uh, I need to actually have a, we'll do object here, but, and it might complain about that. But you do need, it's a generic, I'm not going to worry about that. So it is a, you, you'd, you would map the signal R hub, which, do I have that over here somewhere? I do not. That's the yeah. R chart, you guys. Everyone can read that, right? Yeah. Um, you have to add the signal R, and then you map the signal R hub basically to your endpoint URL. So instead of use and add, it's, well, instead of use, it's the map, and then you still have to do the add. But you have to explicitly add the signal R element to it. Uh, the other piece is, and we'll delete this just because it's not compiling right now. Um, they changed where they changed where the signal R JavaScript client lives. So it's not at, what is it? It's not at ASP.NET anymore, it's at Microsoft now. So I think the old one, or did I get that backwards? Um, so there's that, no. Okay, so if we come here and we manage client-side libraries. Have you guys ever used, oh, not that one. Have you guys ever used the add client-side libraries here? I usually always do stuff with like um, NPM and everything else, so I never really use this, but this was kind of fun just to experiment with. So I want to add a client size library. I go to unpackage, and I go to at Microsoft slash signal R. Yeah, so there, the new one is at, at Microsoft. The old one used to be at, at ASP.NET. They've, they've renamed, they've moved where it is. You can still, the tricky part here was you can still find, if I do the at signal R, you can actually still find their previews out there, but they never actually published their release out there. So just an FYI, the at ASP signal R is dead. The at Microsoft signal R is where you want to go when you want to go to .NET 3. So, or use the latest signal R for ASP Core 3. If you're still on 2.0, you roll back to this one. Uh, the one piece that's nice about SignalR is, and this is the only thing that I was going to actually demo, it now has an automatic reconnect. So if you guys are using SignalR and your server goes down, basically you can, it does an automatic retry. So when your server comes back up, your SignalR connection will automatically, you don't have to write that logic anymore. It'll automatically reconnect. Uh, you do have to add, and I'll put it in here just so you guys can read it. But basically inside your JavaScript code where you're defining it, and when you create your connection, if you just do this with automatic reconnect, uh, if you leave it blank, it's going to try to reconnect at 0 seconds, at 10 seconds, and at 30 seconds. Here I'm basically saying try, every five, try three times at five-second intervals and then stop trying. So you don't have to put the reconnect in there. It's automatically built in now, which is nice. Because I've had many times where it's like, oh, I'll shut down the app and restart it because the server had a hiccup, right? And now we'll do an automatic recheck. Okay, we'll call that good. That, that was my signal R blurb, was things have moved and they now have the reconnect. They also have a couple of other cool things around, uh, I don't know, with regards to signal R, what people are doing, but they also have the ability to um, stream both from client to server and server to client. So you are now actually, you can do real time, like full blown streams that keeps it open instead of just real chatty messages. So 
And that's true. I guess when I say stream, I don't think they stream a video. You're streaming more of just like a bunch of, so stock ticker would be a great example, right? I'm just pushing data all the time and I want it to be updated. They do have the automatic stream, or they've got an open connection to where you can actually just stream data from server to client and vice versa. Okay, let's jump over. And I'm going to cheat on quite a bit, um, but let's get it working. This will be fun, because like I said, I'm one for five. So inside a startup, we know, well, we don't know, but it should be obvious now that we need to add server-side Blazor because you're not going to get it for free out of the box. And we need to endpoints.mapBlazorHub. So um, how many people are familiar with, so, and I'm only doing server-side. I'm not doing the website. That's not coming out until mid-next year. Um, I'm not going to try to do the web assembly side of things. We're going to look at just Blazor server side. Uh, but how many people have heard or seen or just know anything about the Blazor stuff that's out there now? Quite a few. Some people, yes. Some people, no. Um, the magic here is basically since it's all server side, but they're trying to make it seem like it's a client side library at this point in time, um, is it's actually using, it opens up a signal R connection between your client and your server. So that's what this Matt Blazor Hub is doing, is this is making it so that, yes, Initial push, I'm going to server-side render all of your data, but then I'm going to almost give you a ajax -y ability while you're using C-sharp code, but it's not because you're running C-sharp because I'm not doing that part. That's the client side that happens with WebAssembly. I'm not running C-sharp in the browser. I'm actually making a call back to the server every single time I perform an action. The server changes just a little bit of data and then pushes it back up through SignalR and it updates the DOM. So there's a persistent connection when you're doing server-side Blazor. Uh, there's a persistent signal R connection between your client and the server, and that's how the application kind of gets an Ajaxy look and feel to it. So that right there got us our Blazor piece, which is great, because uh, I did already enable web page. Or I already enabled Razor pages. Yes. So now let's come in here, and I'm going to create a component. Let's create a folder called components. And we are going to create a Razor component. And OK, I am going to do full disclosure on this because there's still parts of this that I'm not sure where certain data lives, but somehow they're hanging on to magic data. Um, whatever I name this, I will actually have a class that's named this. If I rename my file, my class name does not change. So I sat here one time and said component, and went, that's a horrible name because everything is a component when you come to a UI. So I renamed my file to hello world component. And every single time I then tried to reference that hello world component, it still showed up as dot component. So I'm not sure where that metadata lives. I was looking for properties on the file. I was looking in the CS proj file. I have no idea. I basically blew away my component and ended up calling it Hello World Component. So I'm going to name this correctly the first time. Component.razor. And, and this is, there are some nuances that you kind of get out of the box when you create a brand new Razor or Blazor application. Um, and so these are just some of the pain points that I actually walked through. I need to actually put this in a namespace. So I'm going to call it secret Santa dot web UI, maybe web UI dot components, which doesn't exist yet, but now it does. Um, so I've got that. I'm not going to, I am going to just copy and paste a simple little controller here because I'm not going to make you guys watch me type code at 7.30 and 7.15 at night. So what we have here is I wanted to figure out how to get a Blazor component that allowed me to take an input value and then also allow me to kind of have the Ajaxy click stuff, right? And this, I sat here and I'm like, okay, that's cool. That, this would be fantastic if that's all I had to do. And for part of what you're trying to accomplish, that's all you have to do. I can come and reference this now and I don't have the syntax completely memorized. So you're going to watch me copy paste again. 
And if I now come to my view, and let's just go to my home index, and let's just put this component. So this is not as pretty as what you get out of Blazor components. Um, you'll notice, so this guy means absolutely nothing. This is a, I'm just telling HTML, you're not an HTML. Don't try to render this tag, right? I'm using a non-standard HTML tag. This means absolutely nothing, but it was just a wrapper around my, basically me trying to say, hey, render my component async. That's going to be now be called hello world component. And let's do this, because I don't have a using in there. So we will do, well, we're going to do secret Santa dot web UI dot components. And hopefully that will then, there we go. So see, I get my hello world component. What's fun is, again, I know, I told you this. I always like to let you guys know that I'm not lying. If I change this to just hello world, and I come back to my index CSHTML, and I do, I still get my hello world component. Um, like I said, I'm not sure where it gets that name from. I'm not sure where that persists from. Because even after I compile, I still end up with hello world component. So there's, there's nothing in this razor guy that has anything to do with hello world, you can see. I defined a namespace, and that's it. But it likes to still do hello world component there. Um, my render that I'm doing is I've got an input parameter, so I'm actually passing in a value. So I'm basically sitting here and I'm saying, hey, render my component async. I want it to be pre-rendered on the server. And since I know that I've got a property called value, I'm basically giving it an object that has value that says Stokes. Fantastic, right? Happy, happy, dumb, lucky. Let's see what happens when we run. Ah, thank you, yes. Uh, would I? So I was teaching class today, and I ran into this same thing. And someone sat there and said, does anyone ever push yes on this button? I mean, seriously, I, I'm not sure. Hey, there's builders, but you want to run code that you that that you haven't edited yet, just to see what happens, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was gonna say, my it always runs. Now I'm trying to figure out what happened to my new code that I implemented. But yeah. It, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yeah. I I don't know. I don't know why we have this. Yeah. Okay, so what did I get from my error? I'll put errors. I did get. I have zero errors. So what did it not like? Failed. Hello world does not exist. Oh, so does that mean it actually changed? Did it actually change that now? Even though it's not lighting up. Oh, it did. Okay, so it must be some generated code behind the scenes, right? Yeah. Okay, hey, look at that. I've got my, my blazer, even though now I'm red squiggly, eh, go figure. Um, my blazer component has the, I wanted it to be hello plus my value that I passed in. So if we come back to the value that I passed in here on index, I've got my value equals Stokes. When I come here to where I was running, I have hello and I'm zero because that's my counter, right? My counter over here. Sat here and said zero, and when click me goes, I should increment my counter. As someone pointed out, I did not add my JavaScript, so we would not expect this to work, which it doesn't. I'm clicking that like a madman. Okay, great. No worries. Let's come into, I'm going to just dump it into my layout. So there is, we hooked up the, um, we, we hooked up the hub for Blazor. But now we need to have, so the server side has a Blazor hub listening over there. It's got, it's sitting there and saying, hey, I'm ready for data. We need to add the JavaScript side to it. So there is a nice little JavaScript piece that somehow they pull this out of thin air because you never actually have to add it like from a NuGet package or anything like that. You just basically throw that script tag in your code without the dash that my editor gave me. Throw, throw this script tag in your code, which basically sits there and says, hey, reference something in the framework directory called blazor.server.js. Sweet, right? Should be happy to go. Let's run that. Let's do this, fn f12. If we look at our 
network, and let's reload this guy. So we look at our network, and we do have, I'm connected here to Blazor. I've got, I'm listening through my Blazor. You can see I've got binary messages going back and forth. Everything looks good. I come up here and I hit click me, and nothing happens. I get no traffic across there. Um, this actually caused me a lot of heartache because when you sit there and you read blog posts and everything else, no, Aaron, this is not a hint that I'm going to write a blog post. Um, <laughs> when you read blog posts, most of the places sit there and say, hey, look, it's working. I mean, this is all you have to do. You've got your razor component. Well, come to find out, I sat here and I'm like, okay, am I really using Blazor? Let's see. If I comment out this and I comment out this, Am I using Blazor? What's, what's rendering that component? Well, not Blazor, because I just commented out all the stuff that was supposed to be using Blazor. So I realized all I did was create a Razor component, which is great, but it's not my bi-directional that I was hoping with Blazor. Um, so I've got a Razor component. I don't quite have a Blazor component. So let's add Blazor stuff back in. And long story short, what it boils down to, oh, that, right, not that one, thank you. That, won't, that one won't help me be happy, yeah. Long story short, what it boils down to is there's like a ton of imports that you need to put in here. But the fun part is, is it's not in a, so like when you come here and you want to add a new file and you look for imports, you get Razor View imports, which I'm like, oh, okay, you know what? That sounds good. Let's, let's pick that. And inside of their template that they had, they called it underscore imports. So I'm like, okay, fine. We'll call it underscore imports. I came in here. I'm just put it at the views level, which is where they had it at. In fact, I think they actually, they, I take that back. They didn't even have it there. They had it inside their root area. So let's put it there. Yes, I do want to move it. So I've got this import CSHTML. And they had all this stuff in here, which no, I was not going to memorize. So they had this. And I'm like, OK, sweet. That's all I need. OK, we're, we're, we're happy. We're good to go. Let's run this. Spoiler alert, it's not going to work. I get nothing. I get absolutely nothing. The most infuriating part about this whole thing is you really don't change a whole lot except for you rename this to be a .razor file. Oh, let me do this. The reason why I knew that something was weird was just like with um, the tag helpers that we use, right? And you get, so when you have tag helpers, you kind of get weird purplish color, right? This, this is a little different color than a standard HTML tag, right? I mean, even, even here, with regards to my navigation, I know that's hard to see, but even A is a little bit different than my LI because I've got my MVC tag helpers in here. So they, Microsoft sat here and said, ah, this is kind of, the, you've now changed what looks like an HTML client-side component, and it's going to do some server-side rendering for you. So you kind of get that little color thing. Well. When I was looking at the Razor app, I noticed that this looked the same as every other element that I had in here. But when I was looking at one that was generated by Microsoft, it didn't have, it, it looked different. It was a different color. And I sat there and I could not tell for the life of me what the difference was until I finally paid attention and noticed, well, you know, their imports was actually a Razor file, not a CSHTML file. So yes, I would love to rename that. And now look at that, it goes purple. I, it's now a different color. I, I changed the name of my imports file, and it's not red anymore. It's a different color purple, which looks way better on my screen than it does up there. Um, but if I now run my app, I got Blazor. All it takes is renaming one file, and everything all of a sudden magically works. I was amazed. So in the network tab, yeah. So if we look, and let me refresh so that open up so we can actually oh there you go. I, it was but that was a great segue into it so yeah you go have an extra cookie or something yeah <laughs> um, exactly so I'm not sure can we zoom in on that oh we can look at that okay so yes this is going to be fun uh, let's zoom in on what we have here um, come on how can I oh well can you guys see this part okay so we'll clear out the current messages I'll hit click me. 
Oh, sorry. So let's, let's clear out the current messages because we actually got it on a timing, weird timing cycle. But you'll notice I get binary messages back and forth all over the place. And you'll notice I've got it up arrow, down arrow. And you get a, I sent up a, hey, dispatch. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah. Can you guys see that okay? Yeah, of course I can. So you'll notice I'm getting a, hey, there's been a mouse click event at this X and Y coordinate. I didn't have anything fancy in there. Um, but yeah, you're basically getting browser events that are being sent back and forth. So that's what was sent up. What was then sent back down, if I scroll, oh, wait, where was I? How can I, oh, there we go. If I now, so that was, how can I get now back to my, let's close that. Close that, maybe. Um, get back to this, there we go. So my up event to my server had some binary data. My down event, oh, now I'm back to up event because it changed on me. So you can see it doesn't really send, yeah, this is fun, because now it's on a, how can I stop? Can you, can you stop? I don't want to clear. I want it to stop actually trying to send me events. Because you'll notice I now have a bunch of events up here. OK, we'll go to this one. This was one of the first ones we had. So we dispatched a browser event that was a mouse event field. But what's interesting to me is it's never really telling you that I actually want to execute a certain method, right? It just sits there and says you clicked a mouse button. And then what came back down was a, hey, Render, here's some JavaScript, which you can clearly see is JavaScript, right? But basically re-render just a section of the page. So I'm not doing a full refresh. And then it comes back and says, yep, on render completed. So we click the button. It sends the mouse event to the server. The server then sits there and says, here's a small section of the UI that I want you to update. So it updates it. And then we get the binary. Now, the one piece here that's interesting is when you do look at this, Inside of my, oh, not there. Where was it? Oh, sorry, sources. If I look at my index, you will notice that it actually does some decorating here. So you can see that it does have a, uh, yeah, that's ugly as sin, but you can basically see that they are blocking out where a blade component is. So it knows kind of what section it's supposed to be updating. So my guess is, and I haven't, I will admit I have not dug into this. My guess is it's not just updating this one value. My guess is it's probably updating this block, very similar to um, what the good old days of web forms when we had the HTML AJAX stuff. I think that exactly. Exactly. Yeah, well, and it's not. Yeah. And I think that that's kind of what this is doing, except now we're using signal R in the middle to send the data back and forth. But yeah. Now, I will admit, one thing that is kind of fun, right, is let's close this down. Um, again, I'm, I'm writing. And yes, this is going to be different. So remember, we're doing, they've got the server side stuff working today. They are actually going to be translating all this into WebAssembly. .NET Core is going to be running on inside of WebAssembly, inside of your browser when this releases from a client-side perspective. So round tripping is not their long-term vision. It's their short term to kind of get this up and going. My understanding is, and I haven't proven this out or anything, my understanding is that once that happens, this is also just going to work. And all I do is basically say use client-side Blazor instead of use server-side Blazor. And it's going to put the right pieces in the right spot. So ideally, you can start writing your components now. And then when you want to go client-side, you're going to be able to go client-side. The click of a button, right? Just like upgrading to .NET Core 3.0. What is kind of fun is, OK, if I F5 this, because assuming that you write an app that probably has more data than just a increment the counter. But if I have five this, and it's not doing a full page refresh as we saw, it is still just using signal R, but I do still get the full debug experience. When I click that button, I now jump into my C sharp code off of that signal R call. So I still get a nice rich debugging experience when something breaks. The cool thing is when you watch their demos online, even when they do the WebAssembly stuff, you still get this same behavior as well. So um, you are actually executing C sharp. Well, this one, you're not executing C sharp code in the browser. But I am able to debug my C sharp code as 
if I'm running on the server, even though I'm kind of just doing a small little signal R blurb to it. So, but that's really all it takes. I, it took me way, I don't even want to admit how long it took me on to figure out what it took to get Blazor up and running inside of a .NET Core MVC app because of how long it took me to realize that imports.razor is not the same as imports.cshtml. It was what should be painfully obvious since my, control, since my component was .razor, I should have just sat there and went, yeah, clearly that should be a .razor file as well, but um, I, I'm changing GUIDs on my solution because my solution had a different, sorry, I say GUID, I don't say GUID. Sorry, Steve. Um, I, I'm, I'm like, oh, my project file is different in my solution, so I need to change the GUID in my solution file and everything. It had nothing to do with that. It's get your imports.razor. So yeah, so long story short, really what it boils down to is map your Blazor hub, add your Blazor server side, create a Razor component, and then please don't forget to import. So, and the, the gotcha here, right, is why this import makes a difference because I can actually comment out, if I comment out this line, everything would break again. Uh, I guess I can't comment out that line. But if I got rid of this line, let's do a control X and save this, and I come back to my hello world razor, you'll notice I'm, I'm red again on that on click. So it was actually trying to reference a, my, my aha moment was when I was looking at their code and I moused over when I saw that that was purple and I sat there and I said, what is that? And it's like, oh, that's a Microsoft ASP.NET Core components.event callback. Well, that's not the on click that I was expecting from a JavaScript type of thing, right? So I realized that there was some magic going on and I just didn't have an import statement that was in there correctly. Um, but yeah, that's, that's really all it takes. I would love to sit there and say it was like a lot of hard work to get Blazor, to really mangle Blazor into MVC. But the nice thing about it is, is since it's not that difficult to put in there, you could actually start taking your ASP.NET Core MVC applications and start adding either, you can start adding some of the Blazor or ajax -y stuff into it now um, without rewriting your whole app, right? I mean, I, I created a component. So ideally, if, I, if I really had more time, what would have been fun would have been to Ajax the snot out of, or Blazor the snot out of this screen, right? Make this, a Blazor component that then when I clicked add, it would just kind of pop up a night or maybe not even pop up a nice little dialogue, but I could just kind of add in line. And when I push save, it would go back to my database and do a save and just update my, um, update my I enumerable. Well, it wouldn't be an I enumerable at that point in time, but update my model with my GIFs. And I wouldn't be sitting there and having to go to a new page to add something new and then navigate back to my index page after I had added blazerize this and say, hey, as I add a new component, just add it to my table and let my database stuff go. Because you still can, um, and I won't go too far into this because now I know we're getting close to time. But one thing that's nice is you do get, uh, if you do at services, I want to, at service? Nope, not that. Uh, I know you can do the add inject, but I might not even get, there we go. So I can add inject my application db context and now I have access to so you can inside of your blazor component actually get dependency injection as well so I could have inside of this click event instead of just incrementing a counter I could have gone directly I mean I could have gone saved elements off into my database pulled the data out of my database so on and so forth so um, it's not like this is just a javascripty thing that's only going to do what javascript can yes I think so. I would actually say that yes, it's so I don't have to use. I mean, why do I pick Node over ASP.NET Core, right? Well, because I've I've got to learn JavaScript for my client side, so I might as well just do JavaScript all the way around. Um, they're kind of doing the exact same thing. You're a C sharp expert. Use the what? They're doing it the other way. Exactly. They're sitting there and saying, "Hey, you're a C sharp expert. You know the C sharp libraries. Why learn?" The JavaScript libraries, right? Um, and yeah, like I said, you can, I can come in here and do HTTP client 
my client equals new. I mean, I can make all types of HTTP calls. And yes, this would work on the server as well. But now I'm not sitting here and going, OK, what library do I want? Or do I want to pull in the fetch library so that I can make something? Am I going to use jQuery so that I can make an AJAX call, so on and so forth? I'm using the exact same libraries that I've always done on the server. I can now type that same code at the client. And yeah, so Blazor, when Blazor comes out with WebAssembly, it is. It's, they've got, they are sitting there and saying this will be another SPA framework. I mean, they're adding routing into it and everything. So you're not making server-side calls to navigate from page to page or anything like that. They're trying to make it a true SPA framework when push comes to shove. And, but you're using the language that you're familiar with to write both sides. Yes. Yes. Well, I, I, and that's the joys about WebAssembly. You know what? You can, you can write C++ if you want to. You can do all of your client-side coding in C++ and just load that into a WebAssembly and you're golden. Yeah. yeah. C++. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. JavaScript's not going. I, I don't see that going anywhere in a long while. Um, yeah. No. Right. Right, no, Java, I will admit, JavaScript, and, and so Blazor, and, and I don't, the server side I don't think has the interop, because I've never really, I guess I've never really tried it, but can the server side do the interop too? So you'll run some in the client and then make some calls back to the, okay. Um, it does have JS interop, so you can actually call JavaScript libraries from within. I was, I was trying to figure out how that would work if I was sitting there trying to run code on my server that is then calling JavaScript in my client, but I guess they've got that figured out probably through SignalR piping or something like that. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, please. Oh, yeah. Yep. I'm actually just going to stand closer to you so you get the microphone. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So, the, uh, <laughs> with, with server side Blazor, um, it can scale uh, to a pretty, pretty good size. So, even on a small Azure machine, they can run 5,000 current clients. On a larger machine, they can run up to 20,000 or more current clients on the server side. And what it's actually doing is it's keeping a, a snapshot of that page that it sent to the browser in memory. So it then, when it comes back and it makes that call, it compares the two pages, does a diff, and that's what it sends out. Oh, gotcha. Okay. The downside to that is if you make a change or the server goes down, all of those clients have to reconnect, and they might lose what they're working on. So that was one thing I really thought about, because they, they, in the demos, they, they do that. They change code, and then they show me the server has to refresh to get that reconnection because the server just lost its little snapshot True. Right. when you made a change. Right. So that's one downside of, of server size Blazor. You have to write your own little code to kind of keep that if you around if you want. And also for state management. Blazor has no state management in it. You have to write your own code to do state management. Now I do think that is changing it once they bring out client side though, right? Or right. at one point in time right. they were the talking about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything's gonna be on the client side. Right. Well no but I mean I guess even I think the state it, I heard state management that again, kind of talking about full spas. I heard that they're actually kind of doing a state man an NGRX type of thing with regards to Blazor as well, if I remember correctly. But I don't know if that's changed. Okay. I won't say NGRX, but a state management. Right. They're going to come out with Blazor. You know, what is it? Blazor native. So you actually be able to make something run native. Oh, like a React native. Okay. Yeah. That works on Windows Phone. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, yeah, so it was really cool. That's cool. Those guys could see. Good. Yeah. No. Working on it. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for that. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll take any input that I can get on this stuff because I find it fascinating. But I know I'm far from the expert on all. So yeah. And then uh, I don't know if you were going to get into like the three point one. You can actually use partial classes now. I did. So I wasn't going to necessarily. It's funny. I had a bullet point on that. Um, I said allows for code separation, new to 3.1. Uh, I was not going to necessarily dive into that because I kind of ran out of time. But yeah, so one thing, what's your name? Oh, John. John? Sean. Sean, sorry. So as Sean was pointing out, if you don't like 
having all of your code, because everyone loves having their HTML. I mean, this is very, to me, this is even like pre-web forms. This is like classic ASP, right? Let's mix our code yeah. and our markup all in the same file. So you can't do it with 3.0, but yes, with 3.1, you can actually pull this code into an actual code behind file. So you can still, you can get back to separation of concerns, yeah. Oh, you, we, get, we get classic, we get cold fusion back. Come on, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the more things change, the more we go back to where we were, yeah. So that's pretty much all I had. If there's any questions or anything like that, I'm more than happy to answer them. Like I said, I know I didn't necessarily cover all that's new in ASP.NET. Um, the docs are great on that stuff. I knew if we wanted to cover everything that was in ASP.NET, you guys would be here for about three more days. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, and I think you have better things to do than three days of listening to me. So yeah, but any questions about what we got? I will be putting this up on GitHub. So, um, and I know Aaron will make the video that we did live at some point in time. So if you are part of the meetup, I think she sends out, do you update the meetup with the video links and stuff? like that? So this will be available. I know sometimes I'm told I talk too fast, so you can slow me or you can speak or you can ignore me and just look at the code. So. Teletech samples get. Daniel Roth is out on the podcast. It's called Adventures.net. So the, the one for Blazor and a num number of the other Microsoft people are out there um, right now talking about Blazor and Daniel Roth. And we, we talk about F Sharp and .NET 3 and things like that. The one with Scott Hunter that I recorded last week is not out yet, so that'll be coming up in the next week. So just do that for podcast. Uh, Adventures in .NET. Cool. I'll have to. I will say, if, if you will make a note of that. Yeah. Cool. Adventures in .NET. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna put that note here so that I have it for later. Yeah. Like that? Yep. Or is it actually like .NET? Okay. Yeah. It's it's like that great URL that Microsoft has of. What is it? Get dot 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 net? Yeah. Get get dot 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 net? Yeah. One thing that Scott Austin told me when I was there is to try dot dot net. Yes. is using client side right now. Oh, is it? Because they're using server side, and because the try dot net runs everything server side, they were getting some good bills for that. So this is the first production website that they switched over to the. To using the client side blazer. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Try dot dot yeah dot net yeah. Oh, that's cool. Okay, that's good to know. So it's even because I know they keep saying I don't even think they're calling it a alpha stage. I don't. I know they're not calling it a beta stage at this point in time. I think it's still a preview stage, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but if they're going to power that with it, that means something. Yeah. Right. Great, it's way to multi multi server it, right? Yeah. All righty, any questions? Well, perfect. I thank you all for your time. Make sure you grab some food, soda on your way out so you stay awake. And it was great seeing everyone. Yeah. <laughs>